Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Every year, families gather around the kitchen table to make one of the biggest, most expensive decisions they'll ever face, whether they or their kids should go to college, and if so, to which one. Every year, we spend over $120 billion to help families pay to chase that dream, to get a college degree that will enable them to earn a good life. And every year, far too many families, that dream, despite all the money they in Washington invest, never comes true. Fewer than half of students who start college don't graduate. Out of 5,000 institutions of higher education, 2,000 leave half of their students earning less than the average high school graduate. And 1,800 of them leave at least half of their students unable to repay their student loans. These stunning stats make clear we have not just a cost problem, but a profound quality crisis. My name is John Cowan. I'm president of Third Way. And it's long past time we stopped only blaming students and started raising the bar on higher education. Why have this conversation right now? Because it's urgent. We have an historic opportunity to restore the promise of higher education for generations to come. As we convene, the 116th Congress is on track, knock on wood or plastic, to reauthorize the Higher Education Act. To create a strong new HEA, we need a comprehensive overhaul that requires the federal government to focus on the quality of institutions taxpayers are funding and to demand, demand institutions have some responsibility for the outcomes of the students they enroll. Why have this conversation with Senator Chris Murphy? Well, for starters, Senator Murphy is on the HELP Committee, where he will play a key role in shaping a higher ed bill. But more importantly, he gets this cause deeply. He cares about the cost of college. He cares about the quality of college. He cares about students and their outcomes. And he has got the guts to forcefully challenge the status quo. Senator Murphy, as you probably all know, is from Connecticut, where he divides his loyalties between the last place Boston Red Sox <laughs> and the last place New York Giants. He played catcher on the congressional baseball team, so he knows how to grind it out. Every election day, you know where you can find him? Working the polls? Commenting on Morning Joe? No. At a Burger King in Torrington, because he says it brings him good luck. That should tell us all that he knows what it will take to win this fight, a smart campaign a lot of hard work, a righteous cause, and a bit of luck. And if we get this passed and onto the president's desk with meaningful transparency and accountability measures that benefit students, that will be a whopper of an accomplishment. <laughs> OK, that pun was bad, but you'll forgive me. Thank you, Senator Murphy, for joining us. Take it away. For the record, I don't spend the entire election day at the Burger King, so I go to lunch at the Burger King. Uh, <laughs> I, I do show up at the polls now and again. Uh, thank you, John, um, for that really uh, fantastic introduction. Thank you to uh, Linnea, who will join me here on stage in a few minutes, and the entire Third Way team for putting this together. Great to see a lot of friends in the audience today. Uh, thank you for caring. Uh, about the future of higher education and for investing uh, all or some of your uh, professional and personal time in uh, this endeavor. I'm going to try to share with you about 10 minutes worth of thoughts on uh, the path forward on accountability, and then I'm really looking forward uh, to the conversation. Um, so I uh, got a great college education. Uh, I went to a, a top private, not-for-profit school for undergrad where I got a balanced liberal arts education. Uh, I went to a great state school for my graduate degree where I trained in a specific profession. I 
had top-notch instruction. I had good career advice. Uh, there's no doubt that I get to have this awesome job today because of my fantastic experience in college. Um, I'm an American college success story, and there are millions others like me all across this country. There are life-changing colleges and universities all over America who care deeply about their students, and we should celebrate them. But for as many me's as there are in America, there are just as many Alduha Leons. Alduha wanted to earn a degree in marine sciences, and he was three years into a program at Savannah State University. But between classes all day and night shifts at the Atlanta airport lo loading luggage onto planes, he was exhausted after three years, and he felt broke all of the time. And so after three years, Alduha dropped out. Now, he was the first person in his family to go to college. His income was low enough that he qualified for a federal Pell Grant, but he still had to take out more than $20,000 in loans just to afford those three years of school, even with the Pell Grant. When he quit, he joined 100,000 students in Georgia alone who took out federal loans and withdrew from the state's college and university system between 2013 and 2015. And across the country, almost one third of students who take out loans leave before completing a degree, according to a report by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Now that's a pretty damning statistic in and of itself, but it gets worse. For students with Pell Grants from the federal government, today less than half those students get a degree in four years. For African American students in this country, only 40% of them who start a degree ever finish it, never mind in four years. And for Hispanic students, the number's just a little bit better, 50%. Now those are stunning numbers. But here's another way to look at this crisis. There are 100 schools in America today where over 28% of the students who attended are so financially destitute that they've gone into default on their loans. Not that they're just not repaying the loans, they're actually in default. And here's the rub. Well, a lot of these students are in financial crisis because they took out a lot of loans and didn't finish college. A whole mess of them are in financial crisis because they took out a lot of loans and did finish college, but their degree didn't get them a job or didn't get them a job that allowed them to pay their bills. What if Alduha had graduated with that marine sciences degree? Well, lots of schools now have marine sciences degree because there's a, uh, not because there's a surplus of jobs in the field, there's actually more graduates than there are jobs in that field, but because it's an attractive program for prospective 18 year old students and it boosts enrollment. Um, there are more graduates than jobs in each year in this field. And having a worthless degree is better than having no degree at all, but tell that to a marine sciences graduate who can't find a job in their chosen field. As John laid out for you, we have an outcomes crisis in higher education today. Too many kids aren't graduating. Too many kids are graduating with degrees that aren't helping them pay the bills. And here's why I wanted to talk to you about this outcomes crisis in higher education today. Because it's our fault, policymakers, regulators, leaders in higher education policy. This crisis isn't on the students, it's on us. We've established a convoluted Byzantine incentive system for higher education in which schools are pushed to care about a million different inputs and outputs, but very few of them have anything to do with the most important thing that we should be measuring and holding schools accountable for, the outcomes of their students. Now, I'm not saying that colleges only follow the incentives that are set by government. Most schools, especially the not-for-profit ones, are mission-based. They, they want to do the right thing for students. But when the regulatory structure pushes you over and over again to care about things that aren't related to student outcomes, it's no wonder that you end up with places like Savannah State, where only about a quarter of the students who start a degree finish it in six years. So what am I talking about? Today, colleges essentially, I would argue, have four regulators. First, uh, um, 
let's admit that four regulators is probably too many regulators. Um, the federal government is the first one uh, through the Title IV financial aid requirements. Then you've got the state governments who regulate through their offices of higher education. Uh, then you've got your accreditors as the third regulator. And then I'd make the argument to you that the fourth regulator is U.S. News and World Report, which um, arguably drives more decisions at some universities and colleges than any of those first three entities. And these regulators care about a lot of stuff. How many books you got in the library, the state of your institution's financial books, what your faculty to student ratio is, how many publications your professors generate, the quality of your buildings. But not one of these regulators is in the primary business of directly measuring and holding schools accountable for whether the student is getting a value for the degree that they or the federal government is paying for. Take the accreditors who grant accreditation to over 99% of the institutions they review and have no standard measurement to assess student success. Just yesterday at our committee's hearing on higher education accountability, the accreditors told us that it was just better off to let the schools come up with their own measurement of student success. Well, what a deal. I would have loved as a student to be able to decide how my grade was calculated instead of allowing the teacher to do it. Take the example of a school by the name of Bluefield State University. Their hand-picked accreditors in 2011 gave Bluefield a clean bill of health. But they noted on their report that the university might want to rethink the electronic signs on campus that were hard for students to read while graduating. That was noted in their report. But what wasn't noted in their report was that Bluefield State graduates 25% of their students and had been stuck at that rate for a long time. And federal regulators, frankly, are not a lot better. A college essentially has to be in complete collapse in order to get their eligibility for federal student aid pulled. Less than 1%, again, of schools ever reach this th threshold. And today we're sending $400 million to schools where over 30% of the students aren't paying back their loans because of this complicated, loophole-prone way that the federal government penalizes schools with high loan default rates. Now, much of the focus of my Democratic colleagues in recent years uh, has been on the for-profit colleges, like a school like Corinthian that got a lot of attention, who avoided federal sanction for years despite regularly failing to live up to the promises that they made to students. And I do think that it makes sense to set the bar a little bit higher for schools whose primary motivation is to make money for shareholders or investors rather than to educate students. That's what Senator Hassan and Senator Durbin's Protect Students Act does, and I think that we should include all of it or parts of it in our reauthorization of HEA. But when I say that the federal government has failed students, I mean that we failed students at every type of college, public, private, for-profit, and nonprofit. Well, we might want to have a tougher set of checks for for-profit schools. The fact that we have no effective outcomes-based accountability system for all schools is the most important problem that we need to solve. And by committing to fix the outcomes crisis across the board for every student, we can frankly bridge the gap between Republicans and Democrats that is unnecessarily exacerbated by Republicans seeing Democrats as only focused on the schools that are owned by Wall Street. Broad-based accountability, frankly, is a pretty conservative idea. No mainstream Republican in Congress is, is advocating for spending a whole lot less money on higher education funding. So if we're all in basic agreement that the federal government's gonna spend $140 billion a year in helping kids go to college, then the fiscally responsible and conservative thing to do is to make sure that we aren't wasting that money on schools that don't move students to degrees or schools that hand out worthless degrees. So how do we do that? First, uh, think about creating a standard that applies to everyone that incorporates multiple measurements. To me, the four most important and most useful measurements are these. First, graduation rates, probably in the six-year time horizon. Second, a measurement of how students are managing their loans. That's loan repayment or loan default. Third, some version of value, some measurement of value. This is the expectation that a graduate isn't just repaying their loans, but that these loan payments don't represent an overly burdensome portion of their income. 
And fourth, the percentage of low-income schools, uh, the, the low-income students that schools are admitting and graduating. And these standards, as I said, should be applied to all schools, not just for profit institutions. Second, risk adjust. There are plenty of ways to do this, but here are just two ideas. First, you could differentiate between the schools that cannot invest more in student success and those schools that choose not to invest more in student success. This is a way to get at some of the for-profit driven schools without lumping every for-profit into one boat. Schools that are siphoning tuition payments away from instruction or support services, they should be looked at differently than schools that put all their resources into student success. Second, you could treat schools with higher numbers of Pell Grant students with a little bit lighter glove so as to make sure that an accountability system doesn't disincentivize schools from admitting students from disadvantaged or lower income backgrounds. Third, and, and this is a third idea here, um, not a uh, third way to risk adjust. Third, we should shift the mission of these accreditors. Give them additional responsibility of helping to advise schools that don't meet these performance standards uh, on how to reform and set higher standards for the accreditors too. If they keep on waving through all these underperforming schools or they fail in their new mission to help schools improve, then get them out of the business of overseeing colleges. We have this unique opportunity, this Congress, to reset the way that the federal government oversees colleges. And I worry that if we don't make this change now, it may be too late by the time that we get around to the next reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. The outcomes crisis in higher education is real and it threatens to bankrupt students, families, and the American treasury if we don't get serious about expecting better results from schools soon. And though this isn't a speech about innovation, I am a revolutionary when it comes to what future college should look like. And I believe that a tougher, more uniform accountability system will usher in a new era of higher education modernization. If you are forced to think about outcomes more seriously, then you are going to get more serious about the new models that will deliver that value to students. It just makes no sense that we still require so many students to sit in classrooms for eight semesters of education in order to get a degree, no matter how much they learn, how fast or how fast they achieve competencies they need in the professional world. Degrees don't need to take four years anymore. Graduate programs don't have to be all tacked on to undergraduate degrees. There shouldn't be just online universities and in-person universities. Um, all this innovation can be geared towards getting better outcomes at a lower cost. But right now, virtually no one in the higher education regulatory structure wakes up every day pressing schools to innovate in order to get better outcomes. That needs to change, and a new outcomes-based accountability system would allow regulators to take a step back and allow for more innovation, knowing that the outcome standards were there as a backstop. I had a great college experience, and so do millions of others that go to fantastic schools all across this country. But just because we've done higher education one way for the last 50 years, 100 years, doesn't mean that we gotta do it the same way for the next 50 to 100. This is a moment to think about major changes that will improve and greatly simplify the way that colleges are overseen. So over the course of the HELP Committee debate on the reauthorization of HEA, I'm going to be an accountability hawk. And for what it's worth, I frankly think that Congress should reauthorize HEA this Congress. Uh, I'm not somebody that supports waiting around until after the 2020 election. So in the next few months, I'm gonna take these ideas with your input, uh, I'm gonna flesh them out uh, into a detailed accountability proposal, a set of proposals that I believe can get Republican and Democratic support. Uh, and that's why I am really excited uh, to be here today and really grateful to Third Way for hosting today's discussion. Thank you and I look forward to talking.
talking about something other than uh, refinancing student loans as the starting point for a conversation about higher education. And I know at Third Way, we've been talking about outcomes for a long time within higher ed, um, but it's been harder to get policymakers to focus on it. And you and I both started uh, a lot of this accountability work in our K-12 conversations. Right. There, the federal government puts in such a tiny amount of money comparatively to what we spend on K-12, and yet there's so many more strings that come with it and, and so much more accountability. Why do you think our much bigger check in higher ed hasn't come with the same level of accountability up until this point, and how can we shift that? Um, well, listen, I, I think we have slowly and finally come to the conclusion that the uh, college degree is absolutely indispensable to the future of the American workforce and the American economy. And, I, you know, for the majority of the last 100 years, we saw college as extra. Um, and so it made sense for us to invest all of this attention on the high school degree, because for most people, the high school degree was enough. And you know, frankly, that era ended a couple decades ago, but it's taken us a little while to catch up and realize that um, we have to be as rabid about uh, the, the quality, the across the board quality of higher education as we do about uh, elementary and secondary education, because that's just what the new economy requires. Second, um, the stakes are different in higher education. You know, when we did No Child Left Behind, it was imperfect, people groused about it, um, but the consequences attendant to closing down one neighborhood school um, are different than the consequences attendant to a big university or college that's been around for a long time, that has roots in the community, a board, uh, an alumni network, um, losing eligibility for federal dollars. And so people, I think rightly, have been um, reluctant to put on the table a tough accountability system um, because getting it wrong involves a lot of political heartache and downside. And I will admit that it is not going to be easy to come up with the right standard and then the right screen to filter out the good actors from the bad actors, um, the folks who we should expect a little bit more from. Um, uh, th that's, a, that's a tough question. And because the stakes are a little bit higher, um, folks have been reluctant to get into it. But I'm encouraged, and we'll talk about this later when we, if we talk about the politics, I am very encouraged. The reason I'm giving this speech is because I think Senator Alexander gets this. Um, I think he understands the importance of broad-based accountability, and I think before he leaves, you know, he wants to do something about it. And so I think we have this opportunity um, to do something a little bit politically daring. So it's not as if there's no bottom lines right now. There are some rules and regulations in place about outcomes, but they're, they're very sparse in federal law. And you know, there's things like the cohort default rate that says if a certain percentage of your students are defaulting year after year, um, you eventually lose eligibility for Title IV dollars. What's not working about things like the cohort default rate, and how would a new accountability system you know, do better than what we've got right now? Yes. Yeah, so First, it's just not tough enough. Uh, there are lots of schools that are failing students that aren't um, inside that, um, uh, that system. And second, schools have gotten really good at figuring out a way to game it. Um, you know, the for-profits in particular have this habit of haranguing students with multiple phone calls per day to try to convince them to go into forbearance, for example, so as to avoid triggering a default which would set them over the threshold. Um, but if you really think about what we, what we require in order to even start a sanctions process, um, it's a pretty ap apocalyptic scenario for a school. If 30% or 40% of your students are not just uh, not able to repay their loans, but have actually gone into default, um, that is an outcomes meltdown at that school. And the fact that, we're, that we have no process before that moment to step in and say, hey, like, let's sit down and talk about, how, about what's happening and how we can put you on a different glide path is a big failing of the system as well. And so part of what we have to build um, is, a, is a graduated response or attempt to build a graduated system in which it's not a cliff that you fall off of. Uh, there's an ability to, for, the, for, for the federal government, or as I mentioned, the accreditors, if folks are a little fearful of the federal government stepping in and playing that role of trying to assist schools in getting better before the crisis. No. 
there's been so much more focus on outcomes that students are getting, I think, over the last few years when we've seen really big, as you say, meltdowns, mostly within the for-profit sector. Right. And a lot of folks would say, you know, that's where we really need to focus our attention. Why are we worrying about these other schools? This is clearly a set of um, oftentimes bad actors or their incentives are very misaligned from the students. So shouldn't we just be focused on uh, getting for-profit actors out of the system who are serving students poorly and let everyone else kind of you know, muddle along and, and they're not going to be as bad as those for-profits? Why isn't that kind of the way you approach this. Yeah, and, I, and listen, I, I, I've spent a lot of time um, critiquing and criticizing for-profits, and, and I admit that I think you do have to recognize that they're different and likely apply a, a little bit stricter standard, but they still only enroll 10% of students in this country, and um, I worry that our focus on the for-profits is in part um, because it's just politically easier uh, to go after investor-owned institutions. It's a lot harder to go after um, community-based not-for-profit schools and schools run by the government. Um, it, it, and so part of the focus on for-profits is deserved. They have 10% of students and um, three times that many, uh, that, that, three times that percentage of uh, loan defaults. Um, but we also have a whole mess load of not-for-profits and publics that are failing kids routinely and right now don't have an incentive structure that pushes them to get better. It's hard to talk about this because they're mission-based schools. It's not as if um, they don't have a lot of people who show up to work every day trying to get students to, uh, to succeed. But we have so many incentives that push them to care about lots of other things besides outcomes um, that you can forgive them uh, for sort of uh, being led astray from that sort of, I, I think, uh, lodestar, that, that, that goal of student outcomes, and that's why I'd argue that you sort of simplify the accountability and regulatory system, um, and I think you'll see all sorts of different behaviors if that occurs. You've talked about the political power and sway of some of the institutions, particularly who have been around for a long time, our job creators in, in a district or a state. Um, and we've seen in the times when even when a school is in meltdown, people kind of getting them a get out of jail free card, both on the Democratic and the Republican side. You know, S Senator McConnell's done it, uh, Representative Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi's done it. What do we do in this new accountability system to make sure that somebody doesn't just call up their representative or their senator and say, hey, can you just you know, let me out just this one time? So, uh, yeah, and I don't know that you're ever going right, <laughs> to eliminate uh, that temptation. Again, because as I mentioned at the outset, you know, these institutions are, um, they are grounded, they are rooted in the community, and there is significant disruption, much more so when, than, when, uh, to a community than when one elementary school um, gets reconstituted. Um, that's why I think we've got to be loud and clear about our commitment to this new accountability system. I think if this is a, a, a hallmark of the HEA reauthorization, if we all commit to it, Republicans and Democrats, then um, it makes it a little bit harder for people to try to do end, end arounds. Second, I come back to this issue of graduating the response, of, of, ha of creating a runway of consequences um, so that it's not all or nothing. Um, when all you have is the complete cutoff of Title IV eligibility, you better believe you're going to have local politicians coming in <laughs> and trying to help a school out of trouble. Um, but you know, if you look at other ways by which you can deliver consequences, one of the ideas out there uh, is um, your shared responsibility, the idea that, that a school might have to sort of pay in um, if they have um, uh, the beginnings of underperformance uh, rather than completely lose all of their eligibility, then I think you um, eliminate that temptation to try to game the system politically. So let's stay on the politics for a minute. Obviously, uh, you are serving in a body that is controlled by Republicans right now, and the other side of the Capitol is controlled by Democrats. Uh, how do we think we're actually going to kind of move this towards a finish line, particularly on, on the accountability side? What are the conversations that you're having that are opening doors with Republicans? And you know, what are some of the concerns that they've voiced that you've been able to you know, connect with them or, or rebut or um, find a place of common ground? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think this, this focus that Democrats have had on for-profit institutions, again, 
I defend it, I've been part of it, um, has created an opportunity um, because, uh, you know, I think Senator Alexander and other Republicans who want to be a party of accountability um, uh, see a broad-based system as a way to do accountability without doing it the democratic way. <laughs> um, and, and I will tell you that when I told uh, Lamar last week that I was coming here to give this speech and to sort of start fleshing out more uh, concretely ideas around accountability, um, his eyes lit up. I, you know, I mean, he, he is um, committed to, to accountability and a, and a, and a, and a broad-based accountability as uh, a piece of this discussion. I think he's really looking for ideas on how to do this today. He has sort of floated this notion of taking gainful employment and applying it uh, on a programmatic basis, which, uh, well, I might, I might suggest that, that, that there's a better way to do it. The fact that he's suggesting a broad-based accountability system tells you that the devil is now in the details about how to get it done. Um, and we have the fortune of the most functional bipartisan relationship in Congress being between the chair and the ranking member of the help committee. If anybody can deliver anything big and controversial, it's Patty and Lamar. They've done it before multiple times. Uh, Lamar, I think, is you know focused on this as a legacy project before he leaves. He's got the ear of Senator McConnell. Um, this is... Um, uh, if Democrats can come around to, to wanting to get it done, this Congress, <laughs> instead of just waiting until we control everything, and if Democrats can coalesce around broad-based accountability, I think there's a deal for the, for the taking in this Congress. Wow. One of the objections we often hear on the left is that if we tie student outcomes like um, earnings or um, you know even some loan outcomes loan repayment to too closely um, to federal aid that people are not going to be able to choose to study whatever they want they are going to have to go into particularly low-income students um, certain kinds of programs certain kinds of tracks if you will and they won't be able to do what we all want people to be able to do read Shakespeare and study about uh, the biology of bees as one of my staff members took in college you know the the broadening of the mind pieces of, of college. How do you respond to colleagues that raise those kinds of concerns, that we're, we're not just focused on employment outcomes, we also want to create good citizens who are curious about the world? Well, you know, I, what we're not requiring is that you make enough money to repay your loans and take three European vacations every year, <laughs> right? What we want is for you to make enough money to be able to repay your loans. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't think that that's an unreasonable expectation um, nor is it an, an, an expectation that would force students to go into something that, that they don't want to go into. If they go into a field that doesn't allow them to repay their financial obligations, then I might argue that there's something wrong with the education that they got or perhaps the choice that they, that they made, um, although this really has to be about institutional accountability. Um, I, I also don't think it's an either-or question. Um, I think today um, we, don't, we don't have enough career-based higher education and secondary education in this country. We do not have to turn into Switzerland, right, where everybody picks a career when they're 15 years old. Um, but we also have to admit that that liberal arts education is maybe n not necessary for the majority or the vast majority of students. Uh, and so I, I think that at the end of this, if you impose a tougher accountability system, what you will get is just a better mix for students and families. You will just have many more career-focused and career-based and, and, and um, private sector integrated mm -hmm. educational opportunities. And you'll still have the Quinnipiacs and the Yales and the Wesleyans to offer you that traditional liberal arts education. You'll be able to have both. I'd argue that we have a little bit too much of one today. So obviously you have a lot of institutions in your state that you represent. Uh, I'm sure they have some feelings about these <laughs> issues. What have those conversations been like and, um, and how do you navigate you know, representing some very, very prestigious universities and then also calling for some really big changes within the system? Well, you know, one of the critiques is the one you just identified. I think there is 
you know, especially in a state like Connecticut where you've got Yale, Wesleyan, Connecticut College, Trinity, you know, there is a, um, a rabid defense of the value of liberal arts. And you, and listen, I'm all in on that defense because I really do believe that the innovation that has happened in this country is due to the fact that we've made this commitment to um, teaching kids how to think. Um, and so I don't wanna give that up. Um, I simply question whether we can afford um, to have, you know, to, to, to give everyone access to a coming of age experience in this country, which is what <laughs> college has become. And I think we gotta have more focused, shorter, cheaper degrees as an option. The second is, um, you know, a, a industry that feels over-regulated and is not super interested in an accountability system just forcing them to fill out more paperwork and answer to a different set of regulators, which is why um, I think this has gotta be paired together, if not at the outset, soon after implementation with greater flexibility to innovate. I mean, that, I mentioned that at the end. I think that's the genius of uh, a tougher accountability system is that it could then allow us to step back and allow schools to experiment more with things like competency-based education or integration of undergraduate and graduate degrees. Um, and, and to frankly, pressure the accreditors to get out of that space, um, uh, I I at least in the m way that they are today, because we have faith that the accountability system is our backstop, mm -hmm. and that if somebody experiments and the experiment goes wrong, well, then it's much more likely that they're gonna have a consequence um, than under the existing system, where if you totally screw up an accountability system, um, you're still very unlikely to ever lose your eligibility. So I think there is a deal to be had here on um, oversight and on the regulatory structure that in the end gets colleges less regulation rather than more regulation. Oh. One of the barriers that we often see is we'll come in and talk to staff on the Hill or members, um, and they and we have had a very different kind of higher education experience than is now the, the you know, average one throughout the country. I went to Mount Holyoke College. It's a delightful place. It has a 90-something percent graduation rate every year, and um, people are doing just fine who graduated from there. But having worked on this policy for a while, I know that is not, in fact, the norm for most students. Um, but it, it's also true of folks who are running for president. They're gonna hear mostly from people like me and not necessarily from right. uh, you know, folks who have had the experience that you described of, of you know, kind of the alternate view of what can happen here. How do we help members and staff really understand what's going on at places that aren't these elite colleges that most of us went to so that we can have a better kind of comprehensive look at the at what needs to be done and what the problems are that we need to fix. Yeah, as I was reading my speech, I, I, I caught myself that I included a reference to four-year graduation rates, and I had remembered that I meant to take that out because four-year graduation rates are not super helpful today because right. the non-traditional student is the traditional student today, um, and, uh, and, and, it, and it is hard to to, to, to drive that home for a lot of my colleagues who yeah. think that everybody graduates from college in four, in, in four years. Um, so part of it is getting uh, legislators um, in front of those students, getting them to institutions where students are uh, taking longer and the good schools that are figuring out how to adapt to those students. Um, and again, I think that this outcomes-based system will force schools and faculty um, to rethink the whole way that they organize higher education. I mean, still to this day, at many, many schools, the class schedules are organized around the convenience of the faculty, <laughs> not the convenience of the students. Um, it, a lot of schools don't take the time to ask students, when is the best time for us to offer um, uh, classes for you. They schedule it around the faculty availability and faculty preference because they can, because yeah. there's nobody that is gonna hold them accountable for not structuring an education around the current lifestyle of students, which mostly involves going to school and work at the same time. Um, but if all of a sudden you had to have a hyper sensitivity to outcomes, um, then you would start having a hypersensitivity to students and the reality of students today. And your question is how do you get 
my colleagues to understand students today. I, I don't know the answer to that except to get, you know, get them before them. Um, but uh, if they do, they'll realize that it's time to change the incentive structure uh, to prioritize what are the new traditional students. We've talked a lot about sticks, but in policy, you think about both sticks and carrots. So on, on the carrot side, um, you know, in, in higher ed right now, we basically have a voucher system. You know, it's, it's the type of system that in, in the K-12 debate, we pushed back against in many ways um, during the last uh, No Child Left Behind reauthorization. We said, you shouldn't just send student with, students off with money in their backpack and they get the same amount of money no matter where they go because the more students you have, have, um, that require more support, that have been underserved throughout their um, academic career, the harder it's going to be to educate them. It's not um, the same to have 1% versus 90% you know, low-income students. Yet that is really how we operate within higher ed. You get a Pell Grant based on your income, you go to Harvard with it, you get the same amount as if you go to you know, a, a school that's under-resourced. How do we think about integrating some carrots into this system so that we're not just saying do better with what you have, but we're actually saying we're, we're willing to invest if, if you actually want to do better. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's the, one, that's the one question that I don't know the answer to yet. I think you're exactly right. Ultimately, if you're going to expect more of these schools, you've got to uh, deliver them with some real tools to get better. And um, the, the problem is, is that, you know, especially when you're talking to state schools that are constrained by state resources, um, it becomes uh, a very difficult question, except for the fact that by applying the accountability standard to state-run schools, you create a new incentive structure for the states uh, to actually put in the dollars. The reason that Connecticut spends the money that it does on fixing its roads and bridges is because the federal government says, if you don't spend X, you won't get our dollars. We wouldn't spend as much as we do if we weren't told by the federal government that we have to match their spend. And so similarly on higher education, if we were to tell public universities that we're gonna expect a different set of outcomes or you might, your students um, might lose eligibility for uh, federal assistance, then states may um, end up putting up uh, additional dollars as well. That's also why I want to get the accreditors into a little bit different space, why I want the accreditors to you know, not just send out a team for three days, but to um, repurpose part of their mission to be that technical assistance. Maybe they don't come with dollars, um, but, but they have the expertise to help schools get better, and it probably would be a more useful mission than you know, some of the things that they're doing today. We talk in accountability in lots of advocacy conversations about two kinds of things. We talk about cutting off you know, federal bottom lines for people that are just really, really bad performing, and then also on improvement. How do we get schools that are um, doing middling but not great to do better? Are those both good roles for the federal government in your mind, or do you see them having kind of different components within uh, your vision of accountability? No, and, and I think that there's, there's a conversation to be had about uh, you know, how you build in these multiple measurements, okay. um, uh, whether you lump them into sort of one, uh, you know, um, one accountability score or standard, or whether you measure schools independently, which would allow you to understand which schools are missing one metric, which are missing multiple metrics, which would then, of course, allow you to have some earlier interventions. Whether the federal government is set up to actually be the entity that tries to step in and help schools get better, I, I don't know. That's why I'm offering accreditors as you know, a, a potential bridge uh, for, for some of that uh, assistance. But um, I, I think by you know, just testing more factors other than loan default rates mm -hmm. and doing it in a transparent way mm -hmm. so that everybody can see um, very easily, uh, who's measuring up and who's not. You just create an incentive structure for schools um, to reach out and get help to um, be a little bit more creative, even if they weren't ultimately losing, uh, losing eligibility. That's why uh, you know, I think the multiple measurements will end up putting some pressure on schools to you know, just get better in order to catch up. We know that the DeVos uh, department has been taking some actions kind of in the opposite direction, you could say, by saying, um, you know, uh, allowing greater innovation without 
actually right. the accountability in place or um, removing what levers of accountability we might have now or that had been put into place by the Obama administration. How can we um, structure a law and, uh, and know that the people who are administering it maybe aren't on exactly the same page as we are about actually how, how it's going to get done? Yeah, I, listen, di difficult, uh, and we're running into that problem in ESSA yeah, right now. Exactly. We set up a, a accountability system in statute that does require the administration to make a lot of judgments uh, when they're reviewing state plans for uh, elementary and secondary education accountability, and uh, the current Department of Education you know, doesn't really prioritize accountability, and so they're letting states get away with stuff that Congress didn't contemplate states being able to get away with. And so I don't know that there's a panacea for, um, uh, you know, malfeasance by an administration that doesn't want to implement the law. Um, there are proposals out there to just outsource the entire question of accountability to the to an administration, let them come up with the decision. I, I would argue against that. I think Congress should be um, as prescriptive as possible in setting up the standards to allow for the, the least amount of wiggle room uh, at the Department of Education so that you don't have this whipsaw from administration to administration on what accountability looks like. I think it's more important to get that standard in statute in as much detail as you can so that there's, an, so that there's certainty um, for schools going forward no matter who's in the White House. So I'll, I'll ask you one more question, and then I'll let you get back to all of the fun over there at the Capitol. But I'm curious, what's driving you? What's, what's driving your focus on kind of accountability, what you might call the least sexy part of higher education? <laughs> um, I, I mean, listen, I know I, it's all relative, but I'm still one of the youngest members of the United States Senate. Uh, and I'm one of the few that's still paying back my student loans. Um, I, I make plenty of money, so I'm in no position to complain, but the year that my oldest uh, becomes college age, my alma mater will trip $100,000 a year. Um, and uh, as I travel the world, um, as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, um, I, you cannot help but come to the inescapable conclusion that our salvation as an economy is anchored in having the most productive, smartest, most innovative, most value-added workforce. Um, the old ball bearing and hammer and nail factories in Northwest Connecticut are vacant. Um, we are not going to be the cheapest place to make anything. We are going to be the place where workers add the most value to the, to the work that gets done here. And so if we don't produce more highly trained workers, um, then we're done for as an economy. But as a young member of Congress who's paying back my own student loans, I'm also in contact with thousands of students who are panicking right now, who are panicking uh, about their complete and total inability to exist in a world where wages are relatively flat and their student indebtedness um, is topping hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year on a regular basis um, and, and so this sort of twin um, crisis of America not producing enough highly trained workers to keep up with the rest of the world and our inability to have any serious conversation about the traumatic reduction of cost gets me here finally you um, I think you or John referenced this at the outset I think you did right at the outset. I have just been generally frustrated on my party's myopic focus on loan rates. <laughs> um, my party has spent a lot of time, rightfully so, on trying to get the loan rate on, uh, for student indebtedness down. Um, but that's like not the conversation that I have when I'm back in Connecticut. People, the heads nod in audiences when I talk about the cost of college. And when I talk about getting the actual cost of the degree or the time to degree down, that's where people get plugged in. They like, they would like a 2% rate on their loans instead of a 6 or 8% rate. But in the end, they really want the price tag reduced. And there's, and there, and, and there's nothing stopping us from doing that other than an imperative from policymakers to force all of these brilliant people in the system of higher education to focus their time on that question 
rather than all the other questions that they are driven to focus on today, like how visible the signs are on the side <laughs> by, we can do better. We can innovate. We can reduce the cost of the degree. We can get more students into careers that pay the bills. But you can't do that if you are regulating colleges in directions uh, other than student outcomes, which is what we're doing today. And I have a feeling that there is a bipartisan consensus right now, maybe not available five years from now, right now, that we can create uh, um, uh, around uh, this really important question. Well, it sounds to me like higher education accountability is an existential issue that we need to focus on right now. And we are so glad for your leadership and your courage in taking on what can sometimes be tricky. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to Third Way for hosting this. Thank you, everybody.